Hello and welcome to this edition of Reading the Bible with Meaning. Uh, some of you have been waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, life has been a little bit difficult and crazy. Well, not difficult, but crazy lately. Uh, lots of things to, to deal with. But we're back here uh, talking about Jeremiah, reading through the book. Uh, and we're going to do the first 25 verses of chapter 2. It's a fairly lengthy chapter, um, but uh, there's a lot to talk about. So we'll dig into this together as uh, as we do the do the word. Um, let's go ahead, if we can, and have a word of prayer before we start. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, I do thank you and praise you for your word, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that guides us as we study your word together. Lord, may that spirit fill our hearts and minds as we consider the words of your prophet, other words spoken so long ago but still relevant for our lives today. Lord, guide and direct our thoughts and understanding to our good and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you recall, we spent some time in Jeremiah chapter 1 last week. And Jeremiah, of course, we know was born during the reign of King Manasseh, who reigned from 687 to 642 BC, and that Jeremiah lived to see the deportation and the destruction of Jerusalem and deportation of his fellow Jews. Now, he may have been in Egypt when that actually happened, so when I say he lived to see it, he lived, he was alive when it happened. And we, we it, were able to date pretty accurately that Jeremiah was commissioned uh, in 632 during this time of political turmoil, right, he's living kind of in the middle of the waning of Assyrian power and the rising of Babylonian power, and Egypt is in the mix too. But the focus then for Jeremiah is spiritual and political. The spiritual side of it is to challenge people to set aside worship of other deities. Really, to, you know, the best way to phrase that is to say to clean up their worship of the Lord of Israel because it was it was complicated not complicated but it was all interconnected with worship of other deities they were engaging in what's called syncretism they were taking bits and pieces of all sorts of different religions and grafting them onto their religion and uh, that was creating something that should not exist kind of a frankenstein's monster religion if you will so chapter 2 I'm just going to we're going to add to this next week but as we start out, chapter 2 is really an historical summary and an indictment against Judah. Um, and so the, the historical summary recalls Israel's slavery in Egypt, exodus in the wilderness, and arrival in Canaan. Those are all important things. And um, uh, the, so what it does is it holds up their idolatrous behavior for scrutiny. It, 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 they're not behaving as they're supposed to behave. So it's both a warning and a call to repentance. And I'll show you how those are interconnected. There's some interesting things going on here that we need to know to make sense of what's happening in the scripture. So let's go ahead and take a look at the text together. I need to make a little adjustment so I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, so um, the word of the Lord came to me. I'm sorry, I got to look up here. The word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not so, so first you start with that phrase, the word of the Lord came to me. So we know that me, and there is Jeremiah, and really most of what follows is you have to hear this as God speaking. So first the command, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, is literally go and read out in the ears of Jerusalem. So again, what we have to be really cognizant of in this case is that Jeremiah's prophecies are written down very quickly. In, in chapter 36 of Jeremiah, the Lord tells him to record and read out uh, what is likely Jeremiah 2 through 6. Okay, So this is not... I want to be careful about this, but this is not interpretation. If we think about it in the original language, this is this is the Lord. This is Jeremiah reading a message from the Lord. 
okay, that he has received. And, and so the words are important, and, and you want to hear, I mean, regardless of what you believe about it, you want to hear the Lord speaking. And what you want to hear, and this, this is hard for us sometimes, but what you want to hear is, is a, the, are the words of a God whose heart is broken by how his people have treated him. You know, it's just, I mean, that you, it adds to the poignancy of the whole thing. So, uh, thus says the Lord, I remember, I remember the devotion of your youth. Your love is a bride. How you follow me in the wilderness in a land not sown. I mean, just amazing. And, and throughout, you know, the word, the word Jerusalem, it, and we don't see this in English. If you study a foreign language, you, you'll get this. But uh, nouns have gender in, in, uh, in other languages. And uh, words, all words. So in uh, in the book in Jeremiah, J uh, Jerusalem is in is a feminine noun, and that's important because you know many times in Scripture uh, the Lord is the husband and Israel is the wife, and if you really want to see that play itself out uh, it overtly, um, read Hosea, get a box of tissues because man, it's really sad. But uh, that so that marriage relationship is in play here. And again, I want to say, uh, just like with places in the New Testament that talk about the marriage relationship, these are not teachings about marriage. These are teachings that are using the example of marriage in that cultural context to convey something important. Okay. They're, they're not teaching us about how marriage should be. They're using marriages as it existed to teach a lesson about something else, okay? Um, well, why didn't they use the scripture to correct our misunderstanding? Well, because that's not the major issue right now, hmm? especially not in Jeremiah. So, um, right, so uh, this, this is, you know, I remember, I remember, right? Now, um, the act of remembering, right? We don't. Well, did God forget? No, 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 no. The act of remembering, when with reference to God, is the act of bringing something to the fore. It's really a sense of I'm reminding you. Okay, I'm reminding you of the devotion of your youth. Okay, just bringing it to the fore, right? To the forefront of attention. So here, it's a poetic way, again, of urging the people, remember. And the words devotion and love are so important in the text, we lose it, right? Um, the word devotion, chesed, um, is, it can refer to an obligation freely undertaken, a commitment maintained, um, even when the other parties forfeited the right to it. Um, those are it's an important word. It's it's it's. I mean, devotion begins to get at it, but it's more than just devotion. And then, of course, the word love. You know, Greek is more precise. Hebrew is more like our English. There's a lot, a wide range of meanings to the word love, but here it refers to loyalty and submission. And again, the biblical picture is of the marriage relationship following the sin in Eden, right? Read chapter 3 of Genesis and see God pronouncing the new reality. And what's interesting about that new reality, and this is where it plays into the relationship between God and his people, is that the wife is called to loyalty and submission. We go, ah, but the husband is called to unconditional love. Love is not spoken of. From the woman's side, loyalty and submission, and then the husband is to love as his wife as he loves himself. Okay, now right or wrong, good or bad, that's the picture that we have uh, of the marriage relationship in that time <clears throat> that is used to describe the relationship between God and His people. So he's he's envisioning the the first flush of marriage, right, uh, and and how. Uh, uh, Israel as the bride loyally followed God out into the wilderness, her husband out into the wilderness, um, right? And again, this is kind of painting the whole Exodus picture uh, or looking at it through rose-colored glasses, but 
you know, Israel, the Lord leads, Israel follows. You know, the Lord loves, Israel responds with loyalty and submission to the Lord. Commitment to the Lord. And that's what's in question here. Not the Lord's commitment to Israel, but Israel's commitment to the Lord. Right? And, and because, and that's an important thing, because remember the context here. The context is bad things are happening in the land of Canaan. And, and Judah is experiencing all kinds of turmoil, and Israel has been completely destroyed. And where is God in all this, right? So, uh, you know, so God's love is never in doubt. That's what this is saying. God's like, I've never stopped loving you in spite of all your stupidity, okay? So that phrase, a land not sown, could refer to God's provision during the wilderness wandering, the manna and the quail. Remember that? A manna and the quail. Now, look at verse 3. <clears throat> Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Okay, Israel was holy to the Lord. The past tense is important there. Okay, it reminds Judah that their present commitment falls short of Israel's first expressions of loyalty. And, and you, what you want to envision here is Mount Sinai, okay? After the incident with the golden calf, when Moses came down with the second set of tablets because he broke the first in anger, and the people swore that they would be loyal. And at the end of Joshua, they swore that they would be loyal and committed um, but you got to look at, so Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. So you got to think about this in terms of the sacrificial system. The first fruits were sacred to God. The first and best of the crop belonged to God. Okay. As a way of recognizing that God was the source of their provision. So here we have this connection of Israel to the first fruits of the harvest. Saying first, Israel is sacred to the Lord. Israel belongs to the Lord. But other people were eating of the, uh, of the first fruits. And that's a way of talking about the Amorites and the Amalekites. The na two of the nations that opposed and attacked Israel in the wilderness. They tried to eat of the first fruits of the Lord. Take what belonged to God. And then they were punished. And so it says disaster came upon them. That's what it's talking about, the Amorites and the Amalekites. Um, but you can also turn that around. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of Israel. Disaster comes upon those who refuse to accept God's claim on them. Okay? And this is the thing. That Israel, God has a claim on Israel. God has a claim on us. And if we, we reject that claim by not doing what God wants us to do, then the outcome is not going to be good. Okay, So we have this phrase too, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. House of Jacob, remember Jacob became Israel. But the mention of the word Jacob and the mention of the word Israel is to remind us that God took one family and grew it into a vast people. Okay, seventy some people went to Egypt with when Joseph was there, and then four hundred and thirty years later, there's a million people. Okay, roughly, you can argue about that, but it was a lot. Okay, and the words also remind us, right, that the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Again, remind us, they should remind us of Genesis you know, from chapter 12 forward that the Lord is the only true leader of the family of God. And that includes the kings, because they were supposed to serve as regents, really acting on God's behalf. Now, interesting thing here, right, is that we're talking about a time when Israel's gone, the northern kingdom is gone, and the citizens scattered, but there's evidence that some of those tribes took refuge, or at least some of the people took refuge in Jerusalem, refuge in Judah. And so, you, I mean, again, you have evidence of that. Um, 
Saul, who became Paul, was a Benjaminite, right? So you have some evidence of other tribes besides the tribe of Judah and the ability to t trace some sort of lineage and ancestry. So verse 5, thus says the Lord. There's, here's where you have to hear the, the pain in the Lord's voice. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? What wrong? What did I do? Right? Now, the first four verses of the chapter set us up for this, these recriminations that follow. So we've moved from, you know, the foundation of the family of God and the, and the, the, the beginning of the tribes and the sons of Jacob to, you know, the exodus, the wilderness wandering. And now we've moved into, we're going to move into uh, the entry, entry into Canaan and the time of the judges. How do I know? How do you know that, Pastor? Well, let me tell you. Can I tell you? The phrase, right? What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? That's a phrase lifted directly out of Judges. And if you've read the book of Judges, and it's great fun. It's also very sad, but great fun. How they... Uh, the people would, would they would disaster would fall upon them right because they had they abandoned god they denied god and so they faced disaster and and so they cried out to god and god raised up a judge and the judge saved them from the disaster they faced and the people were faithful and then that judge died and the next generation went far from me, far from the Lord. So this frequent abandonment of the Lord. And what was the abandoning? What did it look like, right, to serve false gods, to serve, in those days, foreign deities? So I'm going to wax eloquent here in just a second. So look at the phrase. Look at the phrase in the, in the ESV, went after worthlessness and became worthless. Um, I like the translation emptiness better. So they went after emptiness and became empty. I like that. And and what you see here is now we've moved. And this is we've already seen this in scripture. We we've moved from monolatry, which is the worship of one god to the exclusion of others. We've moved from monolatry to monotheism. The belief that there is only one god. So before the existence of these other gods was acknowledged, which made it a matter of choosing which God to serve. Now we're moving theologically in the Bible, moving to make the statement that the other gods don't exist. <coughs> Sorry, they're human creations, okay? Human creations. They're empty. They're empty. Um, when we do Isaiah, now I'm probably going to do Isaiah next. When we do Isaiah, you'll see there's some fun stuff in there about that. So, uh, right, so you've got this. Why did they? Why did they go after emptiness? They did not say, "Where is the Lord who brought us from the land of Egypt, who led us into the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells?" Okay, so this question can be understood. Positively and negatively. Positively, it's an act of faith. When disaster strikes, where are you, Lord? And it's not a complaint. It's a, hey, God, I need your help. Okay? And that's the correct course of action. They should be asking, where is the Lord? We need to see him in what's going on around us. Got that? So it's not so much God is gone and we need him back. It's that God is there. I just need help seeing God's work. But most likely here, it's a complaint, a, a repudiation of all that God has done, right? Well, look what God did for us in the past. What, but what has he done for me lately? Okay, what has he done for me lately? That's the, that's the spiritual question. So who, brought, who led us in the wilderness, right? So that's the exodus. In a land of deserts and pits. So the, de the word desert, of course, a waterless place. Remember one of the things they complained about in Exodus uh, was not having enough, to, not having anything to drink, and so God brought water from a rock. The word pits, that's often used to talk about a deep chasm in the desert, uh, a, a rift in the ground that you can fall into and, 
and cannot easily escape. So it's a sign, it's a, often a symbol of danger and destruction. And then you have that phrase, deep darkness, a place filled with unimaginable danger. Okay, that deep darkness is also going to be an image of chaos. Okay, but the point is kind of, I don't want, how should I say this? It is to emphasize uh, how the wilderness is a place that is completely inhospitable to human life. Okay, I don't want to use the word exaggeration, but that would apply. Um, and so the, it, the imagery is supposed to emphasize how much Israel needs God's protection, how much he protected them, and how much he provided for them in the wilderness. Look at what all that God has done for you. Okay. And so you know, the, the right attitude is, look what God has done for me in the past. I, can, I know that he will do for me in the future. Their attitude is, this is what God did in the past, but what has he done for me lately? And that's the bad attitude. And so we continue. I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. And when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. I love that word. So the plentiful land was Canaan, the promised land, right? Um, and so we have this, this description now. Before we had the wilderness as a dark, nasty, scary place full of pets and no water and uh and now we have this plentiful land with fruit and good things. So the, the idea is to emphasize how much better Israel had it in Canaan than they did in the desert. But I love the phrase, you're going to see this a number of times, my land, my heritage. Okay. Who does the earth belong to? Right? The Lord. Why? He made it. The how is not important. Right? Genesis just says God made it. It belongs to him. He can do what he want with, wants with it there. I just summarized the first two chapters of Genesis for you. You're welcome. Okay? It's my land. I can do what I want with it. Okay? And so what did God choose to do? To, to make the land good and fruitful and to set it up as a place where Israel could dwell, his people could dwell. But Israel was not grateful to God. Within a generation of their entry into the land under Joshua, they were messing it up, okay? And I, I brought you, right, into a plentiful land. Now, um, the abomination piece of it. So, this is, you, you got to parse this. We're talking about uh, spiritual and religious practices in Israel, not agricultural skill. You made my heritage an abomination. God set apart this land as a place where he could be worshipped uh, properly, okay? Or as properly as humans are capable of. And I guess not so much, right? It's not so much because God requires our worship. It's because as we worship God, we demonstrate our dependence on him. And, and in depending on him, um, we're living the best possible life, okay? Doing what God has told us is best for us. Now, this abomination, this defilement, this spiritual and religious abomination, you know, past history, present, uh, present conduct in Israel, okay, in Judah. There's this syncretistic religion being practiced because of King Manasseh. Hopefully you remember old good old King Manasseh. 55 years he reigned and he was not a good person. So, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what this abomination is. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. All right, so we've shifted while still maintaining a connection to Israel's past, We've shifted to, to Judah's present. Now, the priests did not say, where is the Lord? Okay. Um, not an indictment of the priesthood per se. Remember, Jeremiah came from a priestly family. But it's more of a, an indictment of the priests who were not leading the people properly in prayer. Okay. So they asked the question, again, they asked the question, where is the Lord? 
it's it's it, it's not a question of well where is god i can't i mean why isn't god here okay it's more a, a question of help me see god help me see god um in in the in the things that are happening around me um it's it's more about what is what is it's seeking more about seeking God's will in the current situation, and, and then you have the phrase to handle the law. Those who handle the law, it's the idea of teaching. And if the people aren't properly taught, they aren't properly taught to follow the law, then they're not going to do it. And if they're not shown how to follow it, they're not going to do it correctly. Um, they're calling on the Lord, but they're calling on the Lord in ignorance. And and here's where we begin to get this idea of syncretism that we're going to see more. They're they're calling on the Lord in the way that uh, other nations called on their gods, you know, seeking to manipulate God, not remembering the proper state of their relationship with God, okay, not remembering what God had done for them because nobody's telling them about it, right? It's like trying to understand the New Testament without ever once touching the Old Testament, you can't do it. Not properly. That's why we have all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, cults and whatnot, coming out of the New Testament because they've rejected the old, and you need the old to understand the new. All right, I'll get off that soapbox. So it says, the shepherds transgressed against me. Shepherds, sometimes used of kings, but not often. So those responsible for the the spiritual and religious leadership of the people is what's going to be in play here um, and then the word bail and we've seen this word before but it really is just a generic term at this point so where we use god in a generic way bail is used in the in the biblical text as a generic term for all false gods all foreign gods now all false gods okay remember we've transitioned now from foreign gods are not gods of foreign nations foreign gods are now false gods gods that don't exist okay now the point right the point again is that there's this syncretism going on the leaders are treating the lord like they treated the false gods and and in these other religions the expectation was that if you put in the proper spiritual coin the god would give you the prize you were seeking so the whole idea is that all I have to do is keep God happy, and he'll keep doing what I want him to do. And they're empty, right? They do not profit, okay? Because you're expecting something that doesn't exist to do something for you, okay? Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord. I love that. Uh, at the city gate where one person brings a claim against another citizen that's that's the contention i will still contend with you declares the lord and with your children's children i will contend okay so think about the legal system of the day where were these cases decided often at the city gate okay bringing you bring your case against someone and so the verse here remembering what we had before the verse here presents the lord as a husband bringing a claim against his wife okay and the reference to your children's children speaks of that pervasive character of disobedience. And I think, too, references the failure of parents to instruct their children in matters of faith and religion. You know, when I was growing up, there was this movement to say, well, I'm not going to raise my child in any religious tradition so they can make their own choice when they grow up. And for my generation, more often than not, the choice was no religion at all. Because I'm not raised in religion, I'm not going to choose religion. Okay? I'm, you know, I'm not in the religion I grew up in, but I'm still in religion. You know? So that religious instruction early on is important, and it, so it's being ignored here. For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see or send to Kedar and examine with care see if there has been such a thing has a nation changed its gods even though there they are no gods but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit right so um 
The uh, generic way to say this is look to the west, look to the east. Cyprus was to the west, Qatar was to the east. So travel far and wide and see if there's any example of this. Has there ever been a nation who changed its gods? Okay. Even though they are no gods, right? So what's the question? Have, has a nation ever traded their old gods for new ones? No. Uh, the, the pattern, an established pattern, is not that you get rid of your old gods, but you add new ones. That's the Romans were great at that. They just gave them new names, but they, they, the Romans were great. So, uh, and the whole idea is you're trading in worthless things here. No one would trade uh, their gods for non-gods. That's the implication. Why would you trade Yahweh, Lord of Israel, for a god somebody made out of a block of wood or stone? So I love that phrase again, my people, my people. You see that again and again. Right? These are my people. Why, why are they doing this to me? Right? I have made them my people. And so the Lord is accusing it. And, and the words and actions, the words and the language uh, make it clear that this is foolish. It's stupid, right? It's like God saying, well, you know, here you go. You, you've, you've traded me away for gods that don't exist. And to quote my late grandmother, that's just stupid, okay? Just stupid. And, 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 you know, and you're just, yeah, it's just dumb. You're trading away something profitable or something with no profit. It's like when uh, the, the Spanish first, um, I'll use the word, invaded Mexico. And they would bring these beads, these glass beads that were the, a color that the people and the natives in Mexico liked. But they wanted to trade these cheap glass beads for gold. And, and some of the natives did it, not because they were stupid, because, but because they were hoping to get the Sp Spain to ally with them against their enemies. Okay, But there's no profit here, spiritual or otherwise, in the trade. No profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So the Lord is the plaintiff in this case against Judah. We're still in kind of this legal, legal way of thinking about it. And calling upon the heavens as witnesses to Judah's crimes. Be appalled, O heavens, be shocked, be utterly desolate. What he's saying is that the, the offenses of which Judah is accused should provoke outrage. Outrage. Okay? Again, setting up the case for what is about to happen to Judah. Again, after Jeremiah's, you know, at the end of Jeremiah's time, yeah. But what about these sins? Okay, so kind of boil it down to two side, two things. First, they, force, they have forsaken the Lord. And that word forsaken, they've abandoned, they've, they've walked away, they've, they've completely repudiated the Lord. That's what's in, in, in that. They just walked away. I'm not going to look at what God, all that God did for me. I don't care. I'm going to go serve this other guy because it's more fun. You know, they put themselves in a dangerous position because they're repudiating the only one who can protect them. Repudiating the only one who can protect them. And in forsaking the Lord, they've cut themselves off from the source of life. Look, the fountain of living waters. That's how God describes himself. That's what Jesus will say about himself later. Living water is running water. Water that is constantly on the move. And living water is the best kind of water. And water is a source of life. If you've ever li lived or ever lived in a desert environment, you know that. Okay, here in the desert, my most expensive utility is water. And you have an intentional, again, an intentional contrast here. You have cisterns that are used to store water during the rainy winter season so that there's water available during the dry summer season. But the best water 
It's not the water in the cistern. The best water is living water, running water. Okay, and and so you not only is uh, Judah relying on s water out of cisterns, but they can't even build a decent cistern. They haven't plastered it. They haven't shored it up. They haven't made sure it won't leak. So it, it just that's the these broken cisterns are the false gods to whom Judah has sworn its allegiance. They can't do anything. Okay, that's the point here. It's like, wake up. Have these false gods ever done anything for you? Is what kind of what God is saying. They're not going to do anything for you now. And then I love this question. Is Israel a slave? Is he a homeborn servant? Why then has he become a prey? We have a change in imagery and a return to questions. And I love these questions. Is Israel a slave? Is Israel a homeborn servant? Why has Israel become a prey? Okay. So, the implication to this point, right, has been Israel deserves punishment. They deserve trouble for their actions against the Lord. Now, the first two questions are really the same question, slightly different forms. Is Israel a slave? Is Israel a homeborn servant? Okay, so the first question you ask, yes, in the sense that Israel is properly the slave or servant of the Lord. Slave, again, the word slave has a... Has a, a bad connotation in American culture. So that's often why your translations, English translations in America will use the word servant. Okay, but think indentured servant in this case. Um, but uh, for, a, for it, in the ancient world, slavery, selling oneself into slavery was often the best economic decision a person could make. Because they'd be fed, clothed, cared for. Yeah, they didn't have their freedom, but in many cases, they simply would not have, wouldn't have mattered. There was that in. I mean, they effectively were free. They just belonged to somebody else. So, is Israel a slave? Well, yes, um, but um, not to the right master. Um, which is another, by the way, another way to translate Baal. Um, They've chosen another master instead of the Lord. Then that word homeborn, that phrase homeborn servant. Now, in the biblical context, a child of a servant born into a household where the servant served essentially became a valued member of the commun of the family. Okay, still belonged to uh, the household, but you know, it was it was some a better there was a chance uh to gain freedom and that would be israel's status had they chosen to remain faithful to the lord but instead the image invoke evokes the time of israel's captivity in Egypt when they were in fact slaves and not in a good way okay now the third and final question allows us to interpret the answers to the first two negatively because of the word pray and the wet word means plunder. Why have they be, why have they become plunder or spoil of war? Why have they become something to be fought over? Okay, <clears throat> and this looks forward to what the Ju Judah will suffer under the Babylonians. Okay, and maybe also a little bit reflects what happened to Israel in 722 BC, you know, a century earlier, um, under the Assyrians. The lines have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. So, again, metaphors piling up here, mixed, if you will. But another metaphor for Israel's condition is to be the victim of a lion. And, yes, there were lions in that region, by the way, just so you know. Um, but these lions have, have turned Israel into slaves or servants. Um, <clears throat> and... The made his, and the lions would have to be, again, in 722 B.C., it would be the Assyrians. In 580, 587, 597, it would be the Babylonians. Okay, lions are often royal emblems, royal symbols. So you can look at that in the sense of oh, these four Assyrian and Babylonian kings. So, But the destruction that's envisioned here, again, I think could reach into the past and look into the future. Okay. And, and, and note the general sense here, right? So it, it, is Jeremiah prophesying exact dates and times? No. 
No, 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 no. And that's where we run into problem with prophecy. We want it to be precise, never precise, unintended to be precise. Okay, because what we're, what we have here is not just this is what's going to happen. Period. End of sentence. But this is what will happen if you do not change your ways. Okay, and the fact that it did happen, well, they didn't change their ways. That's what it tells us. Moreover, the men of Memphis and Tapanes have shaved the crown of your head. I love, so this is translated a lot of different ways, um, but I think it's interesting. So Memphis, once the capital of Lower Egypt, it's uh, close by or, or, or uh, equivalent to modern-day Cairo. Um, but Tapanes was near the northeastern border between Egypt and of Egypt, and it was on the route from Egypt to Canaan. That's, that's Palestine. That's the promised land. So, again, between the fall of Assyria and the rise of Babylon, uh, Egypt was a major player in the land. <clears throat> and because of that, Israel would look, Judah would look to Israel, or to Egypt, I'm sorry, as Israel did. And <clears throat> But it never worked because Egypt, Egypt's power was broken. But I love that, that phrase, shave the crown of your head. Other translations, right, I think they get closer to the intended meaning, to lay bare or break. It, it, it's, a, it's a symbol of humiliation, uh, a symbol of, of conquest, if you will. Um, <clears throat> hair's a big deal in some cultures, and, you know, to shave the crown of your head would be like humiliation. But the point is that Egypt is more enemy than an ally to Judah. Don't seek help from Egypt. Don't seek protection from Egypt. And that's hard because there's a long history there. And verse 17 again asks a rhetorical question. Have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Well, yeah, we did. There's that theme of abandonment. You forsook God, therefore God is in his right to forsake you. But here's the thing. While our forsakenness of God might be complete, God forsakes us, but he always comes back to get us. Always. So, God led Israel on the way, and as long as they walked the way that God, on which God led them, everything was okay. But then when they forfeited that, bad things happened. And again, the book of Judges, fantastic example of that. You know, they would forsake God, serve other gods, bad things would happen. They'd cry out to God. God would provide a judge. The judge would save them. They'd turn back to God until that generation died because the idiots weren't teaching their kids. Just saying. And now what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Now don't take this literally. Okay, Understand there's symbolism in place here. But Israel often would seek help, support, refuge, protection in Egypt, right? Joseph, Jacob, took, jo, Jacob took his family there when Joseph was second in command of Egypt for refuge, and they stayed four centuries. There's a couple of times where Moses, uh, Abraham, sneaks down into Egypt. Moses sneaks down into Egypt, right? Or he's in Egypt, right? Um, but uh, seeking refuge there. Abraham's who I meant. Um, and, and that's why you have the water, to drink the waters, to drink the waters. That's to seek refuge. So spiritually, symbolically speaking, Egypt is a poor substitute for the living waters of the Lord. Egypt is not going to give Judah what it wants, what it requires. The Syrians are, they're, they're waning, their power's waning, but they've allied themselves with the Egyptians against the Babylonians. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? But the and this is this is where Jeremiah's prophecy became hard to hear for people. What well, he's like, just sit back. If you go into captivity, you go into captivity, it's gonna be okay. But if you trust the Lord, everything's gonna be okay. Right? But they didn't know. Mm -mm. Your evil will chastise you, and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. So you could say your wickedness will chastise you. 
Sin is its own punishment. Okay, so true prophetic fashion here. This is a warning. Okay, so again, you, you got you to gotta get this in the right context. Not this is what is going to happen, period, end of sentence, but this is what will happen if you continue on your way. Now, I love the word reprove there. It means to correct. So what we have here is a concept that's extremely important to understand. An important, a concept that's important to understand too when we get to the letter to the Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans. Because what you have here is judicial punishment. Okay, this is not capricious. This is not arbitrary. That's why I have that little glimpse into a legal case earlier in the chapter. Because what is being made here is a case against Judah. The Lord is the aggrieved party, making a case against Judah with heaven as the witness, so that when, if, if and when Judah is judged guilty, the punishment they suffer will be just, not capricious, not arbitrary, and the punishment indeed fits the crime. Judah abandoned the Lord. The Lord abandoned Judah. Kinda. But the point is that they have to remember the Lord. Remember to whom they belong. Fear the Lord, right? Fear the Lord. You can take that in multiple senses, but the whole idea is have proper awe and respect for God. And yeah, fear. Fear what he can do. Jesus said it. Fear the one who can send you to hell. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds. But you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bowed down like a whore. Now, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm just deciding how much to say here. But look at the broken yoke. That evokes the image of Israel as an ox. And that oxen were farm animals. And the bonds are the ropes securing the wooden part of the yoke to the ox. Now, that image, you know, the issue there is not that Israel's yoked and bound. They're supposed to be yoked and bound to the Lord, but they yoked and bound themselves to the wrong master. Okay, I will not serve the Lord, but I will serve these other gods. And that's a, it's, and so you have the phrase, but you said, I will not serve. So you can't chalk this up to a mistake or ignorance or misinformation. What the Lord is saying here is this is deliberate. You knew the right way and chose the wrong way. So what you have is a clear refusal to be unswervingly loyal to the Lord. Okay. Then you get to this, these images, to f the phrases, every high hill and every green tree. They evoke the images of shrines to false gods. So before Israel even got into the land, and we see this in Genesis, high places, groves of trees, they were forested areas, and there are some, were shrines. They were places where they put religious shrines. And the hill, you can think, hills and mountains, you, I mean, that makes sense, right? In the ancient world, where are the gods? They're up above. You want them to pay attention, so you make, make your shrine as high up as you can. And you don't put a roof on it. <clears throat> it's open. Because the, the notion, again, in the ancient world is that gods needed to be able to see what you were doing, especially when it involved fertility rites. <coughs> Look it up. Um, so the gods could see what was going on. So uh, there's evidence that those high places were taken over and used to worship the Lord of Israel, but sometimes the old ways snuck back in. Because they were just fun. You no, know? Who doesn't want to get drunk and have an orgy and call it worship? I mean, okay, I said it. And why, you know, why do I say that? Well, the word whore in there. Ooh, we don't like that word, but it's an intentional word. And uh, bowed down like a whore means to assume the proper position for doing what whores do. Was that um, tactful enough? But that's what's going on here. And, and again, this is a blatant, hard, in-your-face accusation. 
right? Not you're worshiping, you're whoring yourself to other gods. And again, read the book of Hosea for crying out loud. Um, but it's important because then it reminds us of the characterization of the relationship between Israel and the Lord as a marriage. So what Israel is doing is not just a spiritual act of disloyalty, but it is a legal act of adultery. Okay? And you will note in Scripture that the punishment for adultery is death. Of both parties, by the way. They forgot that by John chapter 8. But um, So this is, you know... We, God is characterizing this according. I love how some scholars try to pretty that up and make it not what it is, but anyway, it's flat out fact of the matter. Nasty. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? How then? So this links us back to Jeremiah one ten, where the Lord promised that eventually he would replant Israel in the land. And, and it recalls how the Lord planted Israel in the land as a choice vine, holy of pure seed, to yield the best fruits, carefully cultivated. We see this imagery for, throughout Scripture. So having adequately prepared the soil, having chosen the best seed okay, from the choicest vine, having carefully planted it, carefully cultivated it, done everything to care for it. There's no reason why it should not produce the best possible fruit, and yet it did. The vine became corrupted and produced only rotten fruit. How then, God says, after everything I did for you, how could you do this to me? That, that's really what we want to hear. Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord God. So washing, right? That's always a metaphor for cleaning and, and used frequently in the prophets for the idea of cleansing from sin, washing away the stain of guilt. But what you want to imagine here is a launderer who receives a heavily stained garment, say stained with grapes, grape juice, uh, and wine stains. And you can use lye, you can use soap as much as you want, and the garment will be clean, but it'll still be stained. You can still see the stain. And so the metaphor applies that Israel will engage in the required rituals of atonement. They'll go through all the motions of atoning for their sins and sacrificing and all that stuff, but their hearts are unchanged, and God can see that. God can see that though their lips say the right words and their hands perform the right actions, their hearts are still sinful. Okay? Whitewashed tombs, I believe, is the phrase Jesus used. How can you say, I'm not unclean? I have not gone after the bales. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. A restless young camel running here and there. A wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat, sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. So the word unclean, defiled in the ritual sense, and that defilement again results from the pursuit of many false gods represented by the word Baals. Look at your way in the valley. I love this. So by the time the Old Testament was translated into Greek, a couple, three, three, you know, a few centuries before um, Christ, I believe. Don't, geez, don't quote me on that. But, um, the valley in this verse was understood to be the Hinnom Valley, west and south of Jerusalem, from which we get the word Gehenna, a word for hell. It was a garbage dump in the time of Jesus because uh, at the time they believed, and it's probably true, almost certainly true, that children were sacrificed in the valley to the god Molech. We know that this was done. And so it was rendered so ritually unclean that there was no way to purify it, so it just made it a garbage dump. Threw everything in there that they could, and you'd have spontaneous fires erupting. So when Jesus was looking for a visual to describe hell, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, he pointed over to the Valley of Hinnom and said, look, see that? That's hell. You don't want to go there, right? So... Uh, and there may have been Israelites who, or Judahites who were sacrificing children to the Lord, believing that that's what he wanted. 
because they had syncretized. And, and, you know, if they're not being properly taught the law and its interpretation, they could take the commands in Exodus and Leviticus concerning the dedication of the firstborn to the Lord and read that as an excuse to sacrifice their children. Just putting it out there. But the comparison then, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a camel or a donkey in, in Israelite faith. But the way the animals are depicted makes it an insult. First, you have a restless young camel running hither and yon, not really knowing where it's going. Then you have a donkey in heat. And that's Israel, a donkey in heat. And it's like not entirely uh, uh, um, scrupulous about her choice of a mate and, and knowing that as long as she's in heat and just kind of wandering around the wilderness, a male donkey's going to find her. And so uh, it's really the lustful seeking after other gods of the Israelites. Well, God, you know, the Lord Yahweh will be okay. I'm going to go over here and have some fun. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners, and after them I will go. Uh, so that first sentence, keep your feet from going on shod and your throat from thirst, that's what God did. It's interesting, you get to the end of the story of the Exodus, and what we're told is that after 40 years, the, sh the shoes that the people wore in the desert, the sandals, had not worn out. Now, that's a great uh, image of protection. Well, how could that be? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? It's a miracle. You're not supposed to understand it. It is a violation of natural law. That's what a miracle is. And God made the law so he can break it, just so you know. Um, and your throat from thirst, right? So God, you have the story of God uh, telling Moses to strike the rock with his staff and water would come from it. And we never hear really about it again, except that in Jewish tradition, the rock followed them through the desert. And why not? So, uh, God took care of them, and they're like, ah, it's hopeless. I've loved foreigners. After them, I will go. Okay? So, uh, there's political and religious sin here, and it's hard to distinguish between the two. The spiritual sin is, is going away from God to worship foreign gods, false gods. The political sin is trusting in other nations instead of trusting in the Lord, which is also a spiritual sin. So the point of this first part of the chapter is really to lay out what God has done for Israel, some of what Judah is now doing in response, and what's going to happen to them if they do not change their ways. Okay, It's not a statement of this is going to happen whether you change your ways or not. This is a moment of hope. So you read this kind of with blinders on, right, on one side. You're looking at the past but not the future. Don't look at the end of the book yet. At this point, there's still hope. Okay this point there's still hope as we get into next week and the rest of the second chapter um, we're going to continue the indictment for a while but begin to see kind of the i hope we can begin to see the heart of god in this and, and that god is not acting as an angry god but a god whose heart has been broken by his people and that's just a more powerful image to me so we'll check that out uh, next week and god willing and the creek don't rise i'll have everything done on time but let's, let's close with prayer. I want to do that. Father, I do thank you and praise you for your word, the lessons that you give us in your word. And Father, I pray for myself as I pray for all those sharing in this study, Father, that you would indeed instill in us a desire to love you as you love us, to serve you, Father, and not expect you to serve us. So Father, I pray for myself as I pray for all those uh, participating in this study that this time of Lent will be a a journey toward your heart, Lord, toward your heart, that we might recognize and realize the depth of your love for us in sending your Son to die on the cross for our sakes. Lord, watch over us and bless us in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thanks a lot. And we will certainly, certainly see you next week.